Good evening. Welcome to St. George's House in Conversation, the first in an online series in which distinguished guests talk about their life and work. Our guest this evening could not be more appropriate in this time of pandemic. Professor Peter Piot is a world-renowned virologist, perhaps best known for his work on Ebola and HIV AIDS. He has dealt with presidents and prime ministers across the globe, from Bill Clinton to Fidel Castro. He has, as I say, worked across, across the world in research of infectious diseases. He has been variously described as a rock star virologist, and perhaps my favorite description of him as the Mick Jagger of microbes. I think he has even been known occasionally to play in a rock band himself. Peter is currently, among many other things, director of the world famous London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And um, Peter, thank you for making the time to be with us this evening. I've recently been reading your 2012 autobiography, No Time to Lose, which I have to say reads in parts like a thriller, particularly uh, around uh, the discovery of Ebola. But this evening for the benefit of our guests and perhaps especially for the benefit of those secondary school students who have joined us, I want to take you back to your childhood. Uh, you grew up in a small rural Flemish village in a very Catholic family, which on the face of it doesn't seem uh, like a normal, natural background for someone who would spend his life working uh, on infectious diseases. So what was it that triggered your interest in the field? Um, hello, Gary, good to see you and hello, everybody. Um, yes, indeed, like most people in Flanders, I grew up in a Catholic family. And uh, although I'm now married to the daughter of an Episcopalian priest, as uh, the Church of England is known in the, in the US. Um, and um, I, I was inspired by several things. One, on the one hand, I had a huge degree of curiosity, which I still have. And uh, I was always fascinated by microbes. I had a already as a child, a, a microscope, and I would go into the forest and the pools and, and see what you can't see. Through the, so that was one thing. And on the other hand, um, I grew up uh, next to the village where Father Damien um, uh, was born, and uh, he was the local hero. Um, and I went several times. It was the only thing that was happening there, or it was to be seen as a small museum. And, uh, and that made me dream of... Uh, let's say far away, he died and he went to uh, Molokai in, uh, in Hawaii to um, take care of uh, people with leprosy, which was very courageous and he died from leprosy himself. And that was really for me a, a great uh, inspiration. And, but it was also, to be honest, on the negative side, uh, when I was 12 or so, I had one goal in life and it was to get out of here. It was really, I wanted to see the world. And uh, although my siblings, my two brothers, they still live there, they, they say it's so good here. So it was really a desire of seeing the world, but also discovery, science, curiosity, uh, and, um, and contributing to the, that, to the world. And, and the, the Ebola story, Peter, began for you really with a, a shiny blue flask that arrived at your laboratory in Antwerp. Um, t tell us a little about that. Well, I was uh, just uh, just graduated from medical school and was in training in for clinical microbiology, infectious diseases, and working on a PhD also, which was on bacteria, so not on viruses. And then things happen in life sometimes. Um, one day in September, a um, you know a blue thermos arrived um, from Kinshasa. A pilot of Sabina, an airline that doesn't exist anymore, came from Kinshasa and dropped it at the um, you know, uh, at the reception of the Institute of Tropical Medicine, where I was then in, in training, basically. And, um, and with a question mark and a small um, uh, note from the uh, physician in Kinshasa saying that this is blood from a sister, a Catholic nun, who had died with, with the question mark, yellow fever. And, um, 
can you please uh, see whether there are any viruses in there? And in that thermos, there were two glass vials swimming basically in some ice water. Um, and um, yeah, it's out of that, uh, you know, the, the, the blood in that, in these vials that we then isolated the virus. I mean, I was the youngest on the team. I was in, but we, we worked together, we were three. And we also, we were the first ones to see the virus in under the electron microscope. Because viruses you can't see under a normal microscope, you need an electron microscope, which magnifies a few hundred thousands. Um, and what we saw was just amazing. It was like very long threads like spaghettis or warm, worms. And, uh, and that's un very unusual for a virus. They're usually spheres or square or so. And um, so we had to go in an atlas, a viral atlas. This is before, uh, you know, internet and Google and all that just for our uh, young uh, friends uh, following uh, this. And, um, and then there was only one virus that was known with that kind of morphology, that kind of form, and that was Marburg virus, which had been isolated in the, in the German town of Marburg, uh, where it had caused an outbreak, particularly in people working in the lab in a, in a vaccine preparation plant. Um, and then uh, people got infected that way. And, um, and that was very deadly virus. In the meantime, we got the news from uh, WHO that we should stop all investigations that this was a uh, it was an epidemic of hemorrhagic fever hemorrhagic fever means that a fever with where people bleed and bleed to death often and um, we were definitely not equipped in terms of uh, maximal security uh, conditions to work with this kind of viruses and so we were instructed to send it to uh, the US to the Centers for Disease Control in the US and to Portendown uh, here uh, near London um, because there were, in these days, there were only four laboratories uh, that could, were allowed to manipulate dangerous viruses. And three were military laboratories. Portendown was then a military lab, one in the Soviet Union, which still existed, one in Fort Detrick in the US near Washington, DC, and then the civil one was in, um, in Atlanta, Georgia. And, and they then could uh, confirm that uh, this was not Marburg virus, it was a new virus, Ebola. So that's the story. So th the lesson from that is that things can happen, but do your job. And um, if you work in a lab, you know, uh, any sample can contain something completely new. You just have to make sure that you have the curiosity and the technique and the ability to uh, do something new. And what was most exciting is that um, thanks to that, I could then go to Africa. Um, because they were asking for um, volunteers to, to go because at the request of the, the government of what was then called Zaire, the time of uh, President Mobutu was then the head of state. And, um, and I didn't qualify for anything. I had never investigated an epidemic. I had never been to Africa. So particularly in today's world, can you imagine if you don't take off all the boxes, you know, you, you don't even, you're not even considered but then it was a bit different. And also there were not that many volunteers to go. And so I joined an international team uh, led by the Minister of uh, Health of, uh, of Sair and uh, with him. And then, uh, you know, uh, people became then friends like uh, Professor, um, um, you know, Muyembe, who was the first clinician versus scientist who had seen case of Ebola and um, uh, Americans from the Centers for Disease Control and uh, someone from Institut Pasteur in Paris and then South African. So a very mixed group of people who were all there to investigate and stop this epidemic. Yeah, and, and one of the things that, that, that struck me reading your autobiography about when you got to Africa was the way in which you immersed yourself in the culture uh, not just because it was new and different to you, but because you almost had to do that to understand the virus itself and to understand why it was so contagious and what it was about people that made it spread so rapidly. Um, perhaps you would, you would say something about that. I'm thinking particularly, for example, about the human need for touch. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, this was, for me, extremely overwhelming. You arrive in Kinshasa, which is probably one of the most chaotic places on Earth. Um, 
And then uh, 24 hours uh, later, I was in the tropical rainforest in a town called Guma, um, where I met a priest who was really the one who helped us with uh, you know, the logistics and so on. And um, I'm not sure what I was most excited about, this, uh, the discovery of a completely different uh, culture, um, environment, abject poverty, um, and uh, uh, or the, the you know the excitement of discovery, uh, investigating a, an, an epidemic where you don't know how it's transmitted because that's the first question. In order to stop an epidemic, you need to know how it's transmitted. Is this by mosquitoes? That was a concern we had because how can you protect themselves? Um, is it water, food, sex? Um, you know, injections. Uh, uh, air, you know, respiratory, etc. The classic ways that viruses are uh, transmitted. And uh, the, the only way to find that out was to talk to people. That's one of the lessons I, I learned, you know. Um, you go around and you listen to people. You, uh, you have a hypothesis. When we discovered uh, the virus or isolate the virus, I should say, um, that was not a, a scientific endeavor because we just did our job. But when we went to investigate the epidemic, we had some hypothesis, you know, um, that it was transmitted um, through close contact, we thought, because one of the things you do is to define um, the uh, outbreak in three terms, time, place, and person. So how is it evolving? And we arrived uh, after when we, you know, when we plotted the onset of uh, disease of the, the cases, there were about 300 people who actually died. Um, then we saw that we arrived when the peak was already uh, over and we went down. That was interesting. And then you wonder what happened uh, at that peak. And then turns out, oh, they closed down the hospital. So time, place, then you try to map it out. And that the first one to do that actually was John Snow in, uh, in Soho, in, in London, uh, when he investigated cholera. And so he could see that it was uh, people who uh, got the water from a particular pump who got the cholera. So we did the same. Where are people placed? And then you saw it's all around this, this hospital. This was a mission hospital, Catholic nuns. And, um, the, and then the third one, most important person, who are the people? And we found that, uh, first of all, there were very few children, which goes against, for example, a mosquito uh, transmission because why would children be safe? They, they're often the ones that are first bitten. And then we saw also that it was usually uh, mostly um, young adults and with about half, uh, you know, 50% more women than men uh, between the ages of 20 and, and 30. And since we were uh, just men, we, it took us a while to find out what's the difference between men and women at that age. Of course, women can get pregnant. And so then you see okay, what happened? And uh, we saw then, and, and we, we talked to people and we found that the pregnant women had all gone to the hospital. So, and so everything, uh, you know, pointed to that the hospital was the place where something really bad had happened. And to make a long story short, um, and we know that now for Ebola, um, you know, it's those who care for patients, so either at the hospital or uh, in the household, they got infected. Um, so in the hospital, uh, you know, medication was given through injections, and so they were contaminated. Uh, every morning, Mother Superior would um, give five uh, syringes and needles, and these were the ones who were uh, used the whole day through. And then also during funerals, when people are, uh, you know, uh, saying goodbye to their loved ones, and uh, that uh, is, you know, you lay off the body, you wash it, but it's all done with naked hands. But it's a culture where indeed people, you know, um, touch each other. There's a lot of handshaking and so on that, as a start. And, uh, but it's how to say this, I, I love it immediately. I think some people can't cope with it, but I really liked it because of the, um, you know, the, the fact that despite the incredible uh, poverty that these people were um, living in, and that's something that I'll never forget and also determined my life, but also that they, um, the human touch, and they were welcoming and, uh, uh, you know, and helping to find a solution. And they had found the solution actually themselves. They had seen that it was close contact and they stopped doing that. Um, but the, the lesson for me is really in, 
in any research of this kind, you know, for epidemiology, often we go by questionnaires and filling in and so on. And some people go very fast. I was the slowest of all. We would typically go to a, a village at 5, 6 a.m. before the women would go to the fields and then talk to everybody. But in the beginning, you don't talk about why you're here. You talk about, let's say, like they do here, the weather and uh, the family, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it's only then that you start talking about it. And you need to establish that contact and listen above all. And just thinking again about those nuns, you know, the missionary nuns, you, you write very movingly about the work that they were doing. And then the discovery that some of their practices were actually contributing to the virus, the syringes that you talked about. So there, there will have, and indeed some members of their own community had died of the uh, Ebola virus. So there was a moment where you had to tell them that they were, they were actually contributing to the, uh, the, the, the spread of the disease. That must have been very difficult, both for you and them. It was difficult, yeah. On the one hand, um, in that part of, uh, of Congo, as it's now called, Democratic Republic of Congo, even today, um, the churches um, are the only ones who are providing some services in terms of health and education. And that was already the case then in the 70, 1976. But um, I went back five years ago and it was still the case. So they're doing fantastic work. Um, but uh, here, um, you know, what the, the, the problem is when we discovered that uh, these injections were so, um, you know, were a major cause of the spread of, of a virus as a very efficient way of uh, spreading a virus, which injected into people's uh, you know, body directly, um, that was difficult. And I, I was the only um, Flemish person. So I, and the nuns were from Flanders and actually from my part of the country. So we spoke the same kind of dialect. And, uh, and so the international team, even if I was the, the, I was by far the youngest and the least experienced, they had decided that I should inform and tell the nuns. Uh, thank you very much, you know, and uh, so yes, I, I, and I told in, and in Flanders, we are pretty direct people, maybe not as blunt as the Dutch, but close. And uh, so I said it exactly. I said, you know, um, this is what has happened. And, uh, and it is a bit of the, something I've learned also afterwards. I call it the Mother Superior Syndrome. Mother Superior, a fantastic woman. And um, she, but she was a bit of a control freak. And so the, uh, she held the keys to everything, literally the keys. And she, she walked around with uh, like, I don't know, with 20 keys. And, um, you know, and, and, uh, and that was the real, the, the, the problems. They were well-meaning, uh, but none of them was actually uh, trained in, um, even in nursery. The, it was all on the spot. And one of the, um, um, you know, the, the big lesson for me is that for life was that I realized that it's not enough to want to do good, to have the good intentions. You also need to be have capacity. You need to have competence, and uh, uh, and and you need to you know to be excellent in what you're doing. Um, but it was very difficult. To uh, they cried. Um, uh, they didn't want to believe me, frankly, in, initially, and uh, and particularly since I you know I was 27. You know, who is this young guy who? Uh, and they were all much older than I was, uh, you know, uh, who does he think he is and so on. So, you know, the, the classic ways when you're um, confronted with bad news, the first one is denial and no, it's not true. It can't be true. And it was uh, dramatic. And I don't think that um, um, some of them have ever accepted that that was the case, that they ever believed it, because I stayed in touch with them and uh, all of them have died now, unfortunately. But uh, um some of them, they never wanted to believe it. But it was also, interestingly, not only the nuns, but also the traditional healers, um, who would, uh, one of the classic uh, ways of um, uh, traditional medicine in, the, in, the, in that part of the world is uh, scarifications on the front and so on. So with a, um, with a razor blade, if you have headache, you would get vacations. And they would also use the same razor blade um, from one... Um, you know, patient to the other. And we, we also found some uh, outbreaks around a traditional healer. Um, so it was basically 
both the, let's say the Western contemporary approach with injections and um, the traditional approach uh, were equally dangerous. Right. And so then um, in the 1980s, we had the, the advent of HIV AIDS, which very quickly became stigmatized as, as the kind of the gay plague. But I, I, th I think it was even referred to at one point as gay related immune deficiency. But am I right to think that your research in Africa and elsewhere soon convinced you that it was a much more indiscriminate virus than at first supposed? Yeah, in, the, uh, in 1980-81, I came back from uh, first uh, Africa, Central Africa, and then from the US. And, uh, uh, and I worked with, there was still a hospital for tropical diseases. And we started seeing patients from Central Africa, um, Africans and expatriates with a mysterious disease, something we didn't really know what it was, but they all died. It was a kind of immune deficiency with very strange, what we call opportunistic infections. So infections that don't really affect um, people with a, a, an intact immune system. And, uh, and then when the first news came out of the US that this was a, you know, what we call now AIDS, it didn't have a name, it had for some time this awful name, great gay related immune deficiency. And I started thinking, first of all, one third of our patients were women. That was the big difference in these days. And then secondly, I was always, I was thinking, why would the virus care about the sexual orientation of the human host? I always, you know, my, my, um, one of my thesis, uh, PhD thesis supervisor, was Stanley Falco at the University of Washington in Seattle. And he told me, you know, you have to put yourself in the head of the microbe. So that's how we explain it, because we were working on bacter how bacteria, um, you know, uh, develop and a disease, to produce disease. And um, so I think, what's the raison d'etre of a virus? You know, why is it so, why? and that's to survive. And because viruses can only survive if they have living cells and uh, they need be it plants or animals or humans. And so, um, so then, you know, sex is one way of jumping from one host to the other. Um, but I don't think a virus knows whether this is from man to women or from women to man or man to man. And uh, so I couldn't understand that why disease would be limited to uh, gay men. Of course, efficiency of transmission, um, you know, could be higher, particularly through uh, anal intercourse. Okay, that I can understand. So when we saw all these patients, so then I was a bit older and I said, okay, let's have a look and let's go to Kinshasa. And uh, because I had still the contacts, uh, the hospitals I had, the people I'd worked with, and uh, together with, again, with colleagues from uh, US CDC and the National Institute of Health in the US, because they had money, I had no money. I mean, I was nobody. Um, and uh, uh, we met with our uh, Congolese uh, colleagues and we found them, uh, you know, in the big hospital, Mama Imo Hospital. And Mama Imo is the mother of Mobutu. So one of the observations I've made in life is that dictators seem to love their mother and they name all kinds of things after their mother. Here the hospital. And uh, so we, we went to the... Um, the internal medicine wards, one for women, one for men. And the wards were full of fairly young people in these days, my age, in their uh, late 20s, early 30s and so on. And I was then, what, 30 uh, and a bit. And, um, you know, and, uh, and they all, they were dying. They had uh, uh, infections we know today that they're affecting people with AIDS. And that's, uh, I had what, um, now, in, in psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud calls the aha erlebnis, the, the aha moment, so that I said, this is heterosexual. And this is uh, something that is going to be absolutely devastating. Because, again, when it's heterosexual, and, uh, you know, we didn't know yet the virus had not been discovered. This was in 1983. Um, and, um, you know, this is what I want to work on. It, it really, uh, both epidemics, um, changed my life uh, in the sense that um, I, I knew what I wanted to do. I, I found the, um, yeah, my raison d'etre, to say so. And, um, and also, um, I mean, it, it really 
uh, told me that um, these infectious disease threats are still a problem. Because when I was in last year in medical school, I studied in Ghent in Belgium, um, I you know, had some talks with uh, my professors and I said, I want to study infections and uh, microbiology and so on. They said, oh, no, no, you know, no future in infectious diseases. You know, don't we have antibiotics? We have hygiene, we have vaccines. And, um, but uh, that was what uh, I guess today we call career counseling. I don't think that term existed then. And uh, so, but being a slightly stubborn, but also believing that you have to follow your passion and not believing them, I went for infectious diseases. And this is what happened then. And this was the point, of course, where you now had to deal with statesmen and stateswomen, with the big pharmaceutical industry. Um, that was a very different uh, context for you to work in. And how was that? And did, did it take a toll on you personally? Well, first of all, yeah, we, we, we found and we were the first ones to demonstrate that HIV is predominantly a heterosexual uh, infection. But that was not accepted by the scientific community in the beginning. Scientists also have, you know, their, um, you know, their taboos and so on. And they, if you come with another view, that was not very welcome. And for years, and I, we did research, particularly in, uh, uh, in, in, in Congo and in Kenya uh, on HIV. Um, but then I got really, I said, it was good for my scientific career and so on. Yeah, fine. And it was exciting. Uh, every time it was something new that we found. However, I said, you know, how long can I can just, uh, um, you know, document and observe this unfolding disaster? Every year, millions of people were dying oh, more and more. And that's when I said, okay, I don't want to just study the world. I want to change it. I want to stop this epidemic. And then I had the a weird idea that I went to the World Health Organization as a, for a year some kind of sabbatical year to see how policy is made. In it. Now, that's probably one of the last places on earth if you want to change the world. However, I liked it. And, um, and then again, there are things happen in life. Uh, the United Nations decided to establish, to create a special program to fight AIDS and to coordinate all the efforts from the World Bank to World Health Organization, UNICEF, just name it, uh, the High Commission for Refugees, uh, to fight AIDS because it had become so devastating, particularly in Africa, but not only in Africa. And um, I put my hat in the ring and to my big surprise, I was uh, selected. Uh, I still believe because that nobody thought that it would, uh, you know, uh, that we would get it off the ground. Um, and uh, uh, in the beginning, I approached it in a fairly academic way. I said, okay, we, um, we're going to, to document uh, how bad the problem is what we can do about it. And uh, um, that was in 95. And it's only 96 that the first treatment came up. And I thought that's an opportunity. It's not a solution, but at least it's no longer a death sentence for everybody. However, the problem is, and that was announced in Vancouver at the, in, in July uh, um, 96, um, that we can treat uh, HIV infection. If we use three different drugs, that act and they don't cure, but they treat. And you don't die anymore if you take the pills all the time. And, um, but I spoke in the opening of this uh, Big AIDS conference and I said, wonderful news, but now we've got to do everything we can to make sure that everybody in need has access to it. Because the price was then in US dollars, 14,000 US dollars per person per year. Now in the NHS by September, these drugs were available. But if you are in uh, other countries, be it in the US where there is not such a universal health coverage or not to mention in poor countries, people that no access. So I became quite obsessed by making sure that we must bring the price down of these drugs. We must make sure that they're um, available. But at the same time, I also didn't want to kill, uh, you know, innovation because we needed constantly new drugs, new uh, discoveries. And um, the, after a few years, I had, you know, we had made no progress whatsoever. So I was thinking, you know, I'm doing something wrong here. I'm not up to the job or whatever. We need to think about uh, what strategy. And to make a long story short, I consulted with lots of people and we went kind of political. I thought, okay, 
in order to um, put something on the agenda, you know, you have to define it in the two things that really matter in the where the big money is and so on, and that's the economy and its security. So I brought it to the UN Security Council in um, the first meeting of the new millennium in 2000, uh, was uh, chaired by then Vice uh, President uh, Al Gore. And we said, you know, this is a human security issue. Um, and also to for like the World Economic Forum, uh, you know, saying this is uh, affecting um, economic production, uh, companies are suffering and people are suffering, of course. And then, and that's how I then went on a tour and constantly um, tried to convince those in power to deal with it. And um, I, in the beginning, I, I had problems, you know, because I was approaching it in a bit of a, again, academic way, you know, what's the problem and, um, you know, what should we do about it? Uh, but then I, I think, you know, um, I became far more efficient. Did I change? I think yes, in the sense that um, you'll be surprised what I'm going to say, but I got more respect for those in power and uh, for the, the difficulty when you're in power. And uh, there are certainly um, tons of corrupt people and so that I've met, but also, uh, you know, fantastic uh, leaders, uh, be it in politics or be it in uh, you know, in churches. That's how I also hosted a, um, a whole meeting at, uh, at St. George's House in, I think that was in 2000 or so, 2001 maybe, with the various denominations and, and, and various religions, because I said um, religion plays such an important role in the life of so many people, and religious leaders, we have to get them on board. And many of them were actually not very open. They were contributing to discrimination to stigma and uh, condemning people with uh, who had uh, acquired HIV. And so I said, okay, we need to turn that around. And uh, so I, yeah, and the business leaders, union leaders, traditional leaders, whatever you, um, you need a broad coalition when you have a huge problem like that. The medical profession is not going to solve the big problems of the world. We need ourselves, people like me, but uh, we need a broad movement, and that's what we had within yeah. you. And and one of the one of the things you mentioned there, Peter, was about getting um, getting drugs to to the poorer people, poorer countries. And and I'm just thinking now about uh, the coronavirus and this latest pandemic. And do you think there's a danger that it will be the poor and the poorer countries who bear the brunt of it? And is there a way to avoid that? Well, we don't have to look at poor countries, but, um, you know, just look at uh, here at the UK. Um, uh, research at the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine has clearly shown that, uh, you know, people from ethnic minority backgrounds are far more affected by uh, COVID-19, uh, die more often. Uh, same thing has been found in the US. Um, and uh, so epidemics, it's HIV or uh, COVID, they really expose the fault lines in society, but also exacerbate inequalities. Um, now, the one thing that is puzzling for me at the moment is that in Africa, in contrast to what I had expected and uh, others or and feared, um, COVID-19 has not been so as devastating as we thought. On the one hand, uh, it's a much younger population. So that means that people die less often that we know that. Uh, it's being older is a, is a risk factor for severe disease and dying. But it's more than that. Um, and perhaps there is some cross immunity or whatever. But in general, um, it is a matter. There are, there are lots of uh, inequalities. And yes, what, one of the things I've been working on now very, um, you know, a lot intensively over the last uh, few months uh, um, since I'm back to, uh, you know, to work after I fell ill myself with uh, COVID and was hospitalized. Uh, it's particularly through the uh, European Commission. I'm a special advisor to Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission. And um, we've been working with several uh, countries, uh, with WHO, with uh, Gavi, the, the, the Vaccine Alliance, and the Coalition of Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, making vaccines, not only to um, accelerate the development of vaccines, um, and, and against the COVID, but also to make sure that there is equitable access 
because one of the a new word that uh, appeared is vaccine nationalism. It came from the US where President Trump said, you know, vaccines made by, um, you know, in the US, so, sorry, this is, um, I don't know how to do this, my, this is my phone. Um, All right. The vaccines um, uh, made in the US are for Americans. And, uh, and, and so, and, and other, some other countries have also given pure priority. What we have been saying is this problem is not solved until it's solved everywhere. That's the first thing. So we need vaccines for all over the world. And secondly, um, you know, this is a matter again of, um, you know, of justice. Um, and so we, we've put together and this coalition and under COVAX, it's called um, many countries. The UK has also joined uh, last week. China even joined. The US has not joined. Um, but who knows after the elections? And, and that uh, brings together, um, you know, money um, to make sure that uh, also the, in the poor countries, the vaccine will be, will be available. Yeah, I mean, it's an almost impossible question to answer, but how long do you think the current virus will be with us? Well, I'll start by saying that there's only one virus that infects people as humans that has been eradicated, and that's smallpox. There's only one. And there are thousands, but certainly, let's say, easily a hundred viruses that affect us. Polio, we're close, but we've been close for quite a while. Um, so I think that the vaccine will be with us, sorry, the virus uh, called SARS-CoV-2 will be with us for, yeah, probably maybe forever. However, um, you know, the good news is we uh, have been able to suppress it. Um, if there's a vaccine, I don't expect that it will be over because it's unlikely that the first generation of vaccines will um, be perfect, will interrupt transmission and so on. Um, it may only protect like 50% or 60%. It will probably prevent in the first place um, that you die from it and that you, and that you become severely ill, which would be a, a major, major breakthrough. But I think next year will be, uh, should be a breakthrough. I'm optimistic that vaccines will work, but for how long is it for protecting for one year, for five years, for life? Um, what percentage and all, many, many unknowns. Uh, and, uh, and we may need to go to several generations of vaccines, but it won't be, um, how to say, it won't be the silver bullet. Uh, we will have to continue to uh, use face masks, uh, face coverings, um, you know, some basic hygiene, some social distancing, but life will be much, much better um, uh, thanks to that vaccine. Right. It's a, so life will be much, much better, but you don't think we'll, we'll return to pre-COVID normal? Well, we will return or we go to another normal. Um, when you think, uh, I think that it uh, um, depends on how efficient and effective the vaccine will be. However, um, there are certain things that we will have to change and become cultural norms. It could be that shaking hands is over, you know, like in East Asia or South Asia. And so, and who knows that maybe the, the way that Namaste, you know, that had also started during some epidemic. Um, uh, I remember the first time I went to Japan in 1981, uh, I saw people in the street with a, a you know, a, a white uh, uh, face mask. And I thought, hmm, they're, you know, germophobes, they're so scared of microbes. No, 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 it is to protect the others. It is an altruistic, um, you know, uh, act. And uh, anybody who has a, a cold, a running nose or whatever, you know, wears such a mask to protect um, the community. And I hope that that will become also part of our culture, uh, you know, and there may be a few other things, um, but uh, the, we, we will be societies living with COVID um, somewhere or another. Hopefully it will be just uh, now and then a, an outbreak here and there and we're protected with the vaccine, but we don't know. Right. And then I'm not a doom thinker, but there undoubtedly will be other pandemics that are coming up. Um, it's something that people like uh, I and others who work in this field, we've been saying for, for years that this will happen. This is not a black swan that came out of the blue. This is something that, you know, we knew would happen, but nobody knew when, where, and, and how exactly. 
Right. And uh, there was a piece in The Guardian recently which suggested that the UK strategy uh, is for targeted vaccination only. So do, do you think, should we attempt to vaccinate the whole population or only those at most risk from the virus? Well, the, in the beginning, there's no doubt that there won't be enough vaccines for everybody. So we need to make choices, some tough choices. Um, and many countries have now developed a strategy, who comes first? Uh, let's, let's assume if we would vaccinate everybody, we need like 60 million or plus vaccines. And, and most vaccines require two doses, so 100, let's say 100 million uh, doses. Um, but we, in January, in the best case, there will maybe a few, maybe 10 million, maybe at the best. And so the consensus nearly everywhere is that um, healthcare workers and people working in care homes uh, should be the first recipients. They're at high risk, but also they could spread. And so they, we need uh, them. They're, they play an essential role in society. But then the, the discussion becomes more complicated. If you go for the most vulnerable in societies, the ones who die, it's the elderly. And uh, some say, OK, we should first protect them. On the other hand, if you think in terms of the economy and how it's spread, it's more the younger, the younger ones. So there's quite a debate going on. And I think that um, ultimately it may not be necessary to um, vaccinate everybody. We don't know. It's, it's very different for one infectious disease to another. For example, measles, you know, a, which was a big killer before we had a vaccine uh, in children. Um, you know, there you need to vaccinate at least 93, 95% of all children in order to protect the whole, uh, you know, community, society, uh, and that so-called herd immunity. Yeah. There are other uh, infections such as a kind of pneumonia, uh, pneumococcal pneumonia, 60% is enough. If you vaccinate 60%, that protects even the others. We don't know for... Um, for COVID-19. It may be closer to, I don't know, two thirds or so, but uh, uh, that's speculation. Right. So, yeah. Okay, well, just, just stepping back from the vaccine itself. I mean, there is always tension between the politicians and the scientists. We see it here in the UK, we see it writ large in the United States where you have uh, Trump denigrating Anthony Fauci. Uh, so that tension is always there. And I'm just thinking about the, um, the system the government is using at the moment here, tier one, tier two, tier three. Some of your colleagues at the, at the, the London School have been vitriolic about this, that it, it's just not going to work. What do you think? Well, I'm actually a bit milder for politicians uh, in this case. Well, first of all, let's say, not forget, nobody has ever been confronted with this kind of situation. So we're learning while we're doing. What I know is that, um, you know, we need to act um, fast. That's why the title of my memoir, a little, uh, is, is uh, No Time to Lose, because it's about contagion. And, and there, I agree, if, uh, if we would have uh, you know, gone for lockdown a few weeks earlier, that would have saved lives. There's no doubt about that. The question is, at the beginning, how do you know that you're not overreacting and so on? So, but anyway, uh, I think um, I always thought that if we have a, um, or I thought when, but now it's more if, uh, a refined system of massive testing and with very rapid uh, test results, then we can detect and then uh, contact tracing and all that, you know, um, then we can uh, detect very early on where there's an outbreak, where there's a problem. It could be a factory, uh, you know, it could be a meat processing plant, it could be, uh, you know, a neighborhood in a particular country. In, in Korea, it was, uh, you know, around some churches or some nightclubs or whatever. And then you can really um, uh, try to contain the spread around that. That would be ideal so that not the whole of society suffers. Now we have something in between a national nearly lockdown or national measures and then the, the places with the highest uh, problem. So I'm actually um, quite in favor of trying to have a far more local approach. 
And I think that's one of the things, you know, as you can hear from my accent, I wasn't born here that um, I will, I'm so surprised when I discover how centralized this country is. And uh, already in March, I said, let's empower the local authorities. And, you know, Germany has done probably the best job in Europe of all countries with a very strong leadership, Chancellor Merkel, a physicist by training, you know, and uh, they, they made the testing available, they developed their own tests, it's done by the public system, by private labs, by academic labs, and just, and it's the, the mayors and the, the, the lender are in charge. And I think that's, that's obviously has worked much better than our centralized system. Um, but I think the jury is still out what really works best. But at the moment, um, the truth is also that if everybody would follow uh, the recommendations, the rules in terms of social distancing, uh, hand washing, wearing a mask, um, you know, not uh, avoiding uh, crowds. That's what they call in Japan the three C's, although that's probably not in Japanese. But besides wearing a mask, is um, no closed um, you know, rooms and so on without vent ventilation. You, that's, that's really bad. Avoid crowds and close contact. Uh, then, you know, we see it in East Asia. At, uh, uh, earlier today, I spoke for the Asia Business Council and, uh, you know, in near, oh, the whole of East, uh, East Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, there is, life is, I'm not saying back to normal, but the minimal um, disturbance from the, uh, from the virus. And that's because they had, we're very draconian. I mean, when you say quarantine, it's quarantine. They put you in a hotel room and you can't get out. Same yeah. in Australia. Here, okay, you know, we know that uh, this is pretty lax. And uh, massive testing, and uh, everybody wears still today uh, uh, um, a face mask. So we, we could do the same. But I think it means that the principles are the same, but we need to understand that our individual actions have collective um, consequences. It's all everybody has to contribute. Um, and if uh, in our society more and more it's all about me, myself and I, and then we're never gonna stop an epidemic. We have to really think of us as a community and that will benefit us all. Peter, that's a very strong message on, on, on which to finish. Um, it, it just remains for me to say what, what an honor it has been to have you as the first guest in this St. George's House series of online conversations. Uh, it's been hugely interesting, and I cannot recommend to our audience enough uh, your auto autobiography, No Time, No Time to Lose. Thank you very much. And thank you also to all of you who have tuned in this evening. I hope you have found it informative, interesting, and, uh, and indeed ent entertaining. And I hope you'll join us again for future conversations. But for now, keep safe, keep well, and from St. George's House, Good night.